Welcome to Money Talks. I'm Genevieve Westcott with your latest financial news from across New Zealand and around the globe. Coming up, trading among farmers gets the green light from Fonterra's 10,500 farmer shareholders. But how does a giant co-op bury the hatchet with all those farmers who voted no? Fresh from Brazil, we find out just how much agriculture was discussed at Brazil's Rio Summit, an eyewitness account. And hundreds of Kiwi farmers swamp the city of sales as their national convention kicks off. How's farmer confidence faring when it comes to their finances and their economic futures? Joining us on the show today is Glennis Christian, editor of The Dairy Exporter, and Connor English, CEO of Federated Farmers. Great to have you both with us. Thanks, Jimmy. Let's talk about TAF. It went through with a 66% vote. Uh, your take on it, Glennis? Well, I think Fonterra would have been very happy to uh, get that percentage of farmers voting yes. They would have liked more. I think they would have liked quite a lot more. And uh, I believe uh, quite a few of the farmers who did vote yes, they voted yes, but they had reservations. I think it was a last-minute effort by Fonterra to get out some of the big guns uh, formerly in the industry persuade them this was a good idea. So those farmers may have voted yes, but still may have reservations. As the CEO of Federated Farmers, uh, Connor, what's your perceptions about how that vote went and what it means for the co-op in the future? Well, look, the, the critical issue for us was that farmers were able to make an informed decision. You know, whether you're for TAF or against TAF, uh, you needed to have the relevant information and clarity around how it's going to work. Now, unfortunately, I don't think Fonterra, frankly, passed that test. Uh, and we actually asked, our organisation asked uh, for a second vote. We got it. Uh, that put more pressure on Fonterra to get more clarity in farmers' minds. A and I still think there's still a lot of confusion about it. So Fonterra have got a big job to do. Yes, they've got to vote, uh, you know, 66% of the volume, not necessarily of the farmers, but of the volume. They've still got a big job to take those farmers with them and help farmers understand what they're actually doing and what it's going to mean for farmers. Yeah, they absolutely do. And I think there's two ways of looking at the vote. Fonterra says two out of three farmers liked it. But critics will say one out of three farmers did not. That's huge, isn't it? It is. It's a very big level of support um, for a group that sort of came from a few people in different areas throughout the country. They were able to mobilise. Uh, they sent out flyers to farmers. They were able to get quite a good amount of support behind them. And really it was that sort of rear guard action from Fonterra uh, bringing out the stalwarts and the older farmers, if you like, um, that really ensured that the vote went through. I think the issue that it does raise, though, Genevieve, is what is Fonterra's strategy? Where are they going? Uh, what are they doing? What do they need their capital for? Uh, and I think there's still a bit of, uh, again, just not quite enough clarity in farmers' minds. And look, I understand how difficult it can be to communicate with farmers. I understand that it's, you can do a lot of, you can send a lot of stuff to farmers, you can say a lot of things to them, and sometimes they just still don't quite understand. But it's, you know, behoving of Fonterra to communicate far better and get a lot more clarity around where they're going, what they're doing, what they want from the farmers and what, what this change uh, means for farmers and their own businesses. Because I think what's been forgotten in this is, uh, you know, people talk about redemption risk being eliminated. Well, that's true for Fonterra's balance sheet, but it's not true for the farmer. It's simply been transferred from Fonterra to the farmer. And now the farmer's going to go through a bit of a learning process uh, as he, he or she gets to understand what that means for their own balance sheets, what the bankers are going to think about that, and what that means for their own growth prospects. Let me ask you, Glennis. Uh, some suggest that perhaps now Fonterra needs to operate as two groups, Fran O'Sullivan and the Herald. Uh, mm. Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, I think uh, Fran is perhaps going back uh, to the original capital raising proposal that uh, Fonterra put up, uh, which was never voted on. Uh, and that would have done that. It would have spun off some of the more innovative uh, and perhaps risky parts of Fonterra's business into a separate company that farmers had the choice to invest in or not. Now, this is a model that uh, LIC, the Livestock Improvement Corporation, uh, they went this way. They say it's been very successful for them. But Fonterra realised uh, when they put this 
proposition up. They didn't have the support necessary. Farmers were well and truly concerned about uh, outside influence on their company, so it never got to the vote. So I think Fran is really perhaps saying maybe uh, you need to look again at this sort of possibility, although Fonterra maintains uh, this form of capital raising is dead and buried. Federated Farmers, of course, uh, kicking off its big national convention today in Auckland. Uh, what do you think the talk's going to be among farmers about the TAF decision? Uh, I think they'll still be seeking clarity, actually. I think they still want to understand what it actually means for them. Uh, I also think there'll probably be a sense of relief uh, that the, re the vote has been taken and that it is now over uh, and, and we can move on to the next uh, stage. But I, I still think there's a lot of uncertainty out there and, and it just needs to be more clarity. And Fonterra have got to do a far better job than what they've been doing. What else is going to be on the table now for you at the Federated Farmers uh, National Convention? Uh, how much are you going to talk about the economy and the financial future of your guys and gals? Uh, yeah, look, we'll be, have a bit of discussion about that. We've got the Deputy Prime Minister coming along uh, to give his perspective on that, I guess. Uh, but we're also focusing on uh, areas such as water, because uh, in my view that's actually uh, a very critical uh, policy issue that everything's in play right now at the moment uh, in New Zealand, uh, whether it's its ownership, its allocation, its management, its storage and its quality. Quality, everything is up for grabs and uh, what happens the next uh, 12 to 18 months is going to impact the next uh, 100 years actually. So water is a big, big focus, uh, also local government reform uh, and then we've also got a panel on uh, foreign investment because uh, that's, that's... That issue. hasn't gone away has it? I mean nobody's talked about grey for farms lately but uh, it's still a sensitive I issue with farmers. Yeah I think it, it is a sensitive issue, uh, actually in Rio it was a sensitive issue as, as well but it's just getting the balance you know, and, and these things, and you know, we'll just see where we get to on it. We want to talk about Rio when we come back. You're just back from the Rio Plus 20 Summit. Interested to hear your perspective on it. Stay tuned. Coming up after the break, Cyprus puts out its begging bowl and lines up in the queue for a Euro bailout, but it's chasing other rich regions of the world as well. Find out which ones. Is the U.S. teetering on the edge of a fiscal cliff, poised to be put into a voluntary double-dip recession by politicians? And who's going to replace Reserve Bank Governor Alan Bollard when he hands over the reins of power in September? But first answer this in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. What country has the most profitable banks in the developed world, according to the influential Bank for International Settlements? The answer when we return. Come back quick. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you, what country has the most profitable banks in the developed world, according to the Swiss-based Influential Bank for International Settlements? Australia's big banks, who are also the owners of New Zealand's major banks. They've been ranked the most profitable among 13 nations in the developed world for the second year running. We're back now with Connor English and Glennis Christian. And joining us now is Senior Financial Advisor for Spicers, Jeff Matthews. Jeff, welcome. Thanks, Genevieve. Well, great news for the banks uh, here. They're uh, making profits hands over fist, but what's it mean for consumers? Well, I think the consumers, and there's quite a competitive market now. So, I mean, in the mortgage market, there's quite a war going on between the banks. So, I think consumers can take advantage of that. And, and very quickly, I see that we have a new Reserve, uh, Reserve Bank governor, Graham Wheeler, who is not, surprisingly, an economist like the last two. Uh, what's your take on it? Oh, I think it's a good choice. I mean, I think either one, either Grant Spencer, who's a deputy, would have been a good choice. But this, you know, he's been with the Debt Management Office. He's been with the World Bank. And in um, very senior positions oh, totally. with the World Bank. I mean, we're lucky in New Zealand that we've got that many, you know, qualified people. Now, listen, uh, Connor, you are just back from Brazil. You went to the Rio plus 20 summit. What was it all about? What were you doing there? Uh, well, look, it was uh, 50,000 people getting together to have a bit of a chat, uh, along with about 190 uh, governments uh, and, and their respective leaders. And so what I was there, I was actually a part of the, the New Zealand government delegation, and I was also part of the World Farmers Organisation delegation. Uh, and the key thing that they were doing there, uh, or that we were doing there, was negotiating a text. So we've come out with this... Uh, the governments have come out with this Rio Declaration. Uh, it's 49 pages, it's 283 paragraphs. It started off at 81 pages, and over the week that I was there, that whittled down to, to 49, as, uh, and that's the nature of these things. So they did a declaration, and then there was a whole lot of people talking about a whole lot of stuff. A lot of it, though, was about 
oceans, for example. Uh, not so much about agriculture. Uh, uh, what did you pick up about what's going on around the world with agriculture that our viewers would be interested in? Food security is a massive issue and it's right up there. Uh, the simple demographics tell us that there's going to be a big challenge. You've got another couple of billion people uh, and we've got to feed them. And so the, the text around food security, which we had a lot of involvement with, uh, was pretty critical. The aspect that we were particularly interested in was making sure that free trade was seen as a solution to food security, uh, not as uh, a problem for, for food security. And there's a range of views there, but we managed to keep that text in there. Let me ask you, just generally, your impressions of Brazil. But before we go to you, you've been to Brazil. Yeah, it was a long time ago. It was a long yeah. time ago. How is Brazil doing? Uh, it is a much more powerful economy than it was even 10 years ago. Oh, huge. I mean, I think it's the sixth largest economy in the world now after US, China, Japan, West Germany, I think France and I think Brazil's next. So it's getting up there. Obviously it's got huge land mass. It's got, you know, huge amount of forest, huge amount of water. Um, Wonderful resources. Yeah, and I mean they're exporting a lot of it to China and that's where a lot of the infrastructure spends coming in from China to help boost, you know, raw materials that they're taking out of there. So they're in a good good place. But I think they're a bit concerned is the currency's, you know, risen quite high recently and there's still an awful lot of protection in, in, in Brazil. So yeah. work in progress. Work in progress. What were your perceptions of Brazil just as a as an ordinary New Zealander wandering into a place you'd never been before? Well, yeah, I've never been to South America, actually. I, I thought it was a fantastic place. Uh, it's nice and warm. Uh, it grows a lot of things. Uh, I think it's they control about five of the top ten commodities uh, globally. But the fascinating thing, Genevieve, they've got 193 million people. About 15 years ago, they had 100 million. Wow. Of those 193 million people, 70% of them are under 30. So they are very definitely a country that is on the rise. They're, they're going places. Yeah. Uh, what, one of the interesting things that came out of the Rio summit and when you talk to the Brazilians, over here we have this debate about whether growth is good or whether it's bad. You know, should we have growth or shouldn't we have growth? Uh, in Brazil and also at the Rio summit, no one was having that debate. What it's about is how we have the growth. We absolutely will have to have growth. We need to have growth, but it's how you have it. And Brazil's... Uh, you know, it's been marching. It's, it's increased its land uh, production, you know, by 37 percent, but it increased their production by 178 percent. So they not only are they growing more, but they're getting more productive at doing it. Glennis, do you think Brazil is one of those countries where uh, companies like Fonterra should be trying to get into more and more? Let's face it, we can't we can't farm <coughs> many more dairy cattle here, can we? No. We're going to have to go offshore. Yes, and there have been a number of moves made by uh, Fonterra uh, throughout South America in the past. Some of them are more successful than uh, others. But as Connor says, with that population base, that huge domestic population base, plus uh, exports coming out of there, we've just got to be involved at some level. So coming back, what do you think is one thing that we could do as farmers in this country to make more money out of a country like Brazil? Oh, well, I mean, we've got a lot of intellectual property and, and, and know-how. Some of it we may be able to apply in Brazil, but some of it may not may not work there. But, but they're a fantastic market to take our product, whether we source it from here or, or the farms in China, for example. Mm. Uh, so they're, they're, they're part of the global marketplace and a fantastic opportunity. Maybe we could sell them some of our traffic flow uh, intellectual property. You had a bit of a problem there. Yeah, yeah. Well, you don't want to be in a hurry uh, in Brazil. You know, to go about 25 k's from the hotel to the to the venue, you know, it took up to sort of three hours. So you you know, spending six or seven hours in a bus uh, in a day. So it made it very long days. Yeah. Welcome to South America. Yeah. Now, from South America to Greece, uh, a lot of people still worried about it. They have a new financial minister now. Thank goodness. Uh, what's the latest happening over there? Well, I mean, this weekend they've got a European summit and it really Greece is kind of off the agenda. I mean, Spain has been more of the problem recently and then once you get past Spain, then people start looking at France saying, well, hang on, you know, how secure is France? So they need to nip it in the bud and this is three years that, you know, they've been pushing short-term measures which haven't which haven't fixed. I mean, you know, Spanish bonds are up near 7% now, and, I mean, 6 was a problem before. So yeah, 7 is junk bond, isn't it, really? Well, uh, Spain is about to become um, junk bond, so will Cyprus. I think Cyprus and, actually and, is. But. Yeah, and Cyprus now is also joining yeah. the queue. It yeah. wants a handout as well. It says uh, it suffered terribly being so close to, to Greece. Uh, uh, what do you make of that? Not surprising. I mean, you know, the, I think two thirds of the island is kind of Greek, and the one third is is Turkish, um, and there are close connections back and forth between the Greek economy and, and Cyprus. So they've been. 
borrowing money short term from Russia. That sounds really dodgy. Yeah, they're 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 <laughs> they're looking every. They're not just they're just not asking the the eurozone countries no, for a handout. They're no. chasing Russia pretty but hard. When you start, yeah, you you getting getting into into um, you know in with the devil maybe. <laughs> now you're a real United States watcher. Uh, yeah. How do you think it's going? I. It's better than most of the market indicators. If you, you know, we, we talked about it before. If you look at the end of March, you know, banks, car companies, a lot of companies are producing record profits. They are sitting on huge amounts, something like one and a half trillion in cash on their balance sheets. The only reason they're not, they're not doing much with it is the uncertainty, either politically or what's happening in Europe. Once those things can be resolved, you know, there are still mergers and takeovers. The companies are still... I mean, last week, uh, BMW, they're going to invest an extra $2 billion in China to increase production. Volkswagen in Germany, another $10 billion into car production uh, in China. Businesses are making decisions every day, regardless of what consumer confidence surveys show. I yeah, mean, Like, yeah. if you're a farmer, the same... Life goes on. The weather's lousy, you know, the exchange rate's up or down. I mean... Life goes on. Yeah, but realistically, there's no sign that Europe is coming to grips with this. Angela Merkel still holds the checkbook, yeah. oh, and everybody absolutely. dances to her tune. Yeah. She doesn't look like she's softening. What's yeah. your pick? Well, well, look, it's it's a it's pretty interesting, isn't it? I mean, what they're all trying to avoid is the chickens coming home to roost. Yeah. The problem is they've got too much debt, and they seem to think that the solution is having even more of it. Mm. Now, I, I don't get that. Uh, they're going to have to have their day of reckoning. The market needs to clear. There needs to be a bit of a clean-out. And what all those countries are doing is looking to the Germans to pay their bill, pay off their credit card for them. But, but, and but, she's saying, well, I'm not too yeah. keen on doing that. Yeah, but, but what do you do that. with countries like Spain where, you know, half of the youth are unemployed? Uh, it's incredible. How do you solve that problem? Well, you've got to let the market clear. Someone's got to take a hit somewhere, and the longer they prolong it, the worse it's going to get. I mean, every other recession that we've had over the last two or 300 years has generally cleared in sort of 12 to 24 months. And that's because there hasn't been this intervention trying to stop it happening. Uh, you just clear the market. Yes, it's very difficult for people involved at that. There's winners and there's losers, uh, maybe lots of losers. But then they come out of that recession, you get strong growth. These guys, like the Japanese did, you know, they're just trying to hold off, hold off, hold off. Japan had zero growth for 15 years because it wouldn't accept that they wanted to, they needed to be marked to market. Coming up after the break, future proof on the highways and byways of the economic world as our experts point out what's coming up. But first answer this in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. What gathering of worried political leaders kicks off in Brussels on Thursday? Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you what international gathering of worried political leaders kicks off in Brussels on Thursday. The European summit as political leaders grapple with what to do about the Eurozone crisis. The two-day summit won't even be attended by the Greek Prime Minister. He's in hospital recovering from an eye operation. Now let's talk about uh, the European crisis because, you know, your point is that Asia sorted out their problems in what, two to three years? Two to three years. I and mean, we had the Asian crisis in 97. You know, people in Korea took their jewellery in, they got it melted down, everything to kind of help the national economy. And, th that, I mean, Korea has boomed in the last 15 years, and so it can be done. But from a political point of view, um, they want painless solutions, and they don't want to mention the austerity word. But at some point, you've either got to raise taxes, cut expenditure. It's no different from a, you know, a farm budget or an individual budget. If you're living beyond your means, you can't do it indefinitely. I suspect you're going to have to do both. It's yeah, so exactly. dire, don't you? Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, meantime, here at home, uh, the latest um, uh, Westpac McDermott Miller Regional Economic Confidence Survey, mm -hmm. to read that, it's so long, says that... Kiwis lack confidence in almost every local economy region in the country, apart from Canterbury, where nothing really has happened so far, and Southland. Go figure. Well, it's obvious Southland's the best part of the country. It's, oh, it's, you would say that. It's, it's New Zealand's China. Yeah. I mean, it actually is. I mean, it, Southland's been growing at uh, over 10% for the last decade. All because of dairy? Uh, big chunk of it has been because of dairy, absolutely. Canterbury's the same, there's a lot of dairy going into mm. Canterbury, but I think in Canterbury they know that there's going to be $20 billion spent in their region and that will have to give you confidence. Yeah. 
Uh, other regions are not quite so sure, you know, where, where the growth is going to come from. Uh, it's an old question, but again, uh, how much more dairying, how much more intensive dairying can Southland, for example, really take? Uh, what are you hearing, Glennis? Well, there seem to be still sheep and beef farmers down there who have recently converted or are still looking at uh, converting, uh, and more and more of them are operating alongside the dairy industry by uh, being uh, dairy grazers and, and so forth. So, uh, yes, I think there's, there's still room to move. Not a lot, perhaps, uh, and that will be determined by uh, councils and uh, environmental pressure, I guess. Do you think with this TAF green light, if you like, that it's going to encourage a lot more people that were maybe standing on the sidelines to jump in now to the white gold factory, if you like? No, I think there's been uh, quite a lot of negativity in terms of the lower predicted payout for the coming season. So I don't think you'll get those outsiders coming in. It'll be uh, the guys who are already in the business who see that uh, if they take the medium term view, the five to ten year view, things are looking pretty good and uh, they'll see the opportunities and go for it. What are you going to be watching for now in the next seven days, Jeff? Uh, what's caught your well, eye? We'll see what happens in Europe. That might be a, a bit of a blessing. Um, but really, in about two or three weeks' time, we start to see the end of June profit announcements out of the US corporates. So we'll, we'll get a better handle on you know, how well or how, how weak the economy is. And, and yet we already know, though, big companies like FedEx, which is quite a bellwether of yep. how it's going, they're predicting uh, it's not going to be very good in the coming year. A lot of other big uh, companies around the world as well. Uh, Danone for example. They've lost a lot of business because the Spaniards are now buying cheap yogurt, for example. Gee, where are they getting that from? <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, the same kind of thing. A banking issue does become a problem. I mean, you've got German companies who are exporting to Spain. They've got people in Spain who want to buy their products, but they can't get the finance to buy them. So then it means the German banks have to come up with trade finance to facilitate an export. So it does cause problems. How do you think it's going to affect uh, the New Zealand dollar uh, going... Uh, uh, look, we, we, six years ago, we said the New Zealand dollar was overvalued. We still think it's overvalued. I'm over it. I mean, you know, we think 60 cents will probably... Or 65 cents is probably a, a fairer value. Um, I, look, I read BNZ, Westpac, all the other kind of commentaries about the currency. They're all wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you're not picking. And I'm, pe I'm not <laughs> yeah. picking. OK, fair enough. Connor, what are you going to be watching over the next uh, few days? What's caught your eye? Uh, well, our own conference, actually. I think that's the thing that I'm the most interested in <laughs> right, right now. And what's but, really got farmers' goats at the moment? What are the, what are the real nitty-gritty issues that they're going to want some answers to from guys like you? Well, look, I think farmers have had a pretty good, pretty good season overall. There's been lots of grass around, but the, the, the usual things are, are <coughs> there, and that's about profitability. Uh, it's about the ability to farm for generations. It's about the ability to bring their children onto their uh, uh, farms and have successful family farms. Um, those things haven't haven't changed much. It's just different shape and form. I, I guess one of the things for us is that we've got an election coming up in New Zealand uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, you know, these three year periods go around pretty quick. Uh, what are the policies that the current opposition are, are promoting? Uh, how are they going to affect farmers? Uh, things like resource rentals on water. Things like uh, you know biological emissions coming into the ETS. You know, are they going to be positive or negative for for uh, farmers? I think they're going to be negative. And so we're engaged a lot with those opposition parties to see if we can get their policies changed. I think farmers are going to be a wee bit anxious about that, but generally speaking, I think they're pretty good. Uh, they're feeling pretty good about themselves, actually. Glennis, what about you? Well, the uh, South Island Dairy event is uh, winding up today in Dunedin. I was down there, as a matter of fact, on Monday in beautiful, balmy Dunedin. They had 600 dairy farmers out, uh, and they, it, there was a real buzz there, I can tell you that. It's always a very well-attended conference, and it's where South Islanders come to the fore. They come to a conference, they really get together, uh, whereas perhaps in the North Island, uh, you get people from different areas who uh, want to settle some regional differences, but the South Island Dairy event is, is well known for uh, th that level of attendance and uh, unanimity. And it's interesting listening to Connor, you know, talking about uh, farmers and their future and, and what's going to happen. Are we all agreed that, that kind of the, the mom and pop family farm may be dying in New Zealand, that they are becoming bigger, more corporate? Uh, the face of dairying alone is going to change massively, isn't it? Yes, it is. But uh, there are groups now like the uh, Smash, the smaller farmers, who are uh, quite vocal and quite focused on some of those um, mum and dad smaller farms that can be very profitable, particularly with uh, technologies like once a day milking and so forth. Uh, you haven't seen the last of them yet. 
What do you think, Connor? Oh, well, look, if you look at demographics, on the demand side internationally, we've, we've got a really positive uh, future there. It's really optimistic. On the supply side, domestically, it is a bit more challenging because we've just simply got less people. The farms are getting bigger. The families are getting smaller. Uh, but I think there is, uh, there will always be, a, a, um, the majority of farms will always be family owned uh, in New Zealand, just simply because they're the only people prepared to have the long term view mm -hmm. and take the ups and downs of return, you know, over 20 years. The corporates are a bit more sensitive to that and they'll, they'll exit once the returns uh, go negative for, for, for too long. Thanks to my guests, Connor English, Jeff Matthews, and Glennis Christian. Be sure to check out our website at country99tv.co.nz for the latest updates on rural developments here and abroad. Meantime, remember this wise saying, prepare, rehearse, expect the worst. Hi, ich bin's Michel und ich bin Sven und wir zeigen euch heute unseren ultimativen Trick. Keep the faith. See you next time.